Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Line Change, another week of Line Change, the NHL betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Leboff, and joining me for this uh, episode previewing Tuesday's 10-game slate, Nick Martin and Tim Kalinowski. Uh, it's a little bit lighter than uh, we're used to on a Tuesday night. A little bit of a tricky one to handicap. Um, and instead of going with our traditional uh, underdog segment that we like to do on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'll shake it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to focus on a couple, you know, one underdog and then a couple big time uh, plus money props. We'll start with you, Nick. Uh, a player that changed addresses at the trade deadline now in Carolina is what you'll be focusing on for their headliner showdown against the Rangers on uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, I posted a losing bet on Kuznetsov to get a point at plus 150 on Sunday after he was uh, moved to the second line with Jack Drury out and was going to be on the top power play unit. And he got zero points out of Carolina's seven goals, which makes it a pretty horrific look. However, if you actually like look at the clips, he missed a tap in off the post, which happens. Uh, there would have been a goal that would have been absolute gin for me if Martin H. Just didn't. I think he just kind of clipped the shaft and then the crossbar on what was like a, a complete empty net tap in. But the point is, if you're going to play Kuznetsov in those roles, I think he's going to get a point way too often to be plus 150. And I do think that odds makers were fully aware, like they've been monitoring it much more closely the last several seasons in terms of guys moving up the lineup. And I do think they're probably aware of his roles ahead of that game. So I think we'll probably see the same numbers for this one, especially considering Carolina's only minus 150 when they're like minus 245 by close for that game. So I think Kuznetsov will be at that price. Um, I know I had said he was absolutely horrible in Washington, but like we thought, there was obviously the possibility that he got a little invigorated and kind of picked up his level. He's still going to be just a pure offensive guy. So in those roles, I think the number is just a little too long. He's shown fairly well in Carolina's two games. Obviously, it was, a little, it was easy to look good on Sunday for any Carolina skater, but I think the price is probably just going to be too long, and I want to try to target a Kuznetsov upswing. So tentatively giving that one out, hoping the number's about where it was at plus 150. Cool. Uh, for me, I'm going to go with a, a big long shot on Sidney Crosby to score a hat-trick on Tuesday night. The Penguins are taking on the Senators. Uh, right now, the game is sitting as a pick em. There, There's a couple things here, and, and it's, you know, when you're playing a long shot like this, it's going to be you know, 60, 75 to 1, whatever it ends up on. Uh, just make sure you shop around. Um there was so much guffawing and kvetching about the Penguins over the weekend and Crosby and, oh, man, is he going to ask to leave in the summer? Is he going to sign the extension on July 1st? How could he have How, how could he have to suffer through this? Um, you know, everyone feels terrible for their guy who made the playoffs 16 in a, seasons in a row and won a couple cups, some gold medals. Essentially, going to be was he on a stamp yet in Canada, Nick, or is he going to be on a stamp? He's at, he'll be on one soon enough. It's you know you got your heart heart goes out for this guy, this multi 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 millionaire. Um, I poor Sid, yeah, poor Sid. Um, but that said, I think he's the type of guy, uh, and he's got the type of matchup where he could show out, and um, you collect his flowers uh, on Tuesday night in in Canada's capital. Uh, against the Senators team that has completely checked out of the season and has checked out of defending the season and goaltending the season since basically the opening night. Um, so I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities here uh, for Crosby to to get on the board a um, couple times, hopefully. And, you know, you, the headlines write themselves, right? Like, oh, the bravery Crosby shows. Um, still giving it his all. Still trying to will his Penguins into the fight despite what he had to to go through. Um, at the trade deadline, watching Jake Gensel get traded, so that's my underdog. That's my long shot. I I think it's uh it's definitely worth a sprinkle, especially considering the matchup. Tim, uh, you got a little bit of a more traditional play here on uh, for Tuesday night. Yeah. Also, uh, Leboff, give me the uh, the over in that Pittsburgh Ottawa game. Um, you said it. Both teams pretty much quit. So give me a give me a beer league game uh, there in the nation's capital. Help Sid. But, uh, yeah. Exactly. Hey. It, three, I could see a uh, Sid hat trick, and still they lose, and it just adds another, <laughs> another chapter to the uh, poor. I was, Sid, uh, I was once at an Islander Penguins game in 2007 when the Islanders went on that crazy way Dublowitz run to the playoffs. Ryan Malone scored a hat trick. Uh, the Penguins lost six five. He scored a hat trick with a goal in the first minute of every period, uh, and the Islanders still won that one in regulation. There you go. But anyways, 
Um, anyways, yeah, more of a traditional dog. Um, the D- Detroit Red Wings are slight dogs at Buffalo on Tuesday night. And um, when the before the lines dropped, I thought I'd be fading um, <clears throat> Detroit here. They've lost five in a row. It's also a weird spot in that they had this, you know, Western swing. And then it's one more stop at Buffalo uh, before they go home. So I don't love the schedule slot. And I, I was a little bit shocked to see them not be a favorite. Um, I know that they've, again, they've lost five in a row, but Buffalo uh, shouldn't be a favorite versus many teams uh, in the NHL. And I know they play defense a little bit better now and, you know, bone Byram and all that sort of stuff. But um, I just think this is the absolute bottom for Detroit and they still, uh, I just feel like it's a total buy low on the wings here. It's not like my favorite bet on the board, but I tried to follow the rules and pick an underdog while you guys uh, went a different way. So I I don't mind Detroit here uh, as a dog. Interested to see where your guys' thoughts are. I mean, they've been pretty poor without Larkin. And uh, also Rasmussen is going to be, it looks like he's day-to-day now. So um, yeah, again, I don't love it, but I think this is a little bit of a buy low. This is just too too much anti-Detroit for me. You're muted, Nick. I think it's fair to be honest. I was on Detroit on Friday. I thought the price looked too close with the Coyotes. I was kind of in your boat too, like that I don't actually think Detroit is good and gets sucked in and they just got demolished by Arizona. Next night, got lucky to actually fade them with Vegas. And I just think the wheels are still falling off here. It's way more than Larkin, first off. that The fact that they, like it's one of those things that's perfect for their media. Just like, oh yeah, Larkin went down. But the reality is we've been saying for three weeks that this team's been defending terribly and that the wheels were going to come off on that avenue. I thought the get right spot was Friday versus Arizona. So for me, I think this just looks appropriate. They're getting their underlying play is horrible. Now that the goaltending has been mid, they're just, I don't know. I I can see it, but I I feel like, and I, I, you know, I hate to like, you know, give you shit for the pick because I like how you've reached for a dog. I just think for me, I'm like, and I'm partly just mad because I lost on Friday with the wings, but I just don't think they've shown me like what I wanted to see in either of those. It feels like kind of a big, like just betting the team that's supposed to be better just because of the number kind of thing for me. So. And betting them because you're like, Oh, they, they're still in it. They have to win. Um, yeah. And I, and I mean, I totally are, feel that too. I, I just, I don't Sabres think Buffalo six, makes your life in one. Yeah. Last 10, like better underlying numbers. I just feel like it, it looks kind of reasonable. We'll see. It's, I, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. It wouldn't be surprising to see like this be the absolute bottom that weekend back to back. And then the, the group responds. I, I do think that they have the offensive talents to like make the Larkin loss a little more mitigated. And that my biggest belief is their flaws lie with those veterans on the back end that are just always going to get exposed. But yeah. Interesting one for sure. Yeah, uh, I'm with Tim. I like the the Red Wings here. Um, at a pick them or better. I think that you, it's a good buy low spot. As Nick said, like the, the offensive upside is still there. I just we knew that the the shooting and save percentage bender was gonna come back to bite them at some point. It did uh, in a in a big way in uh, consecutive days. But uh, the Sabers team with their and and they've been improving and. A lot of that has just been by shutting games down. I don't think that that's how this one is going to shake out. And I, I like the Red Wings to be able to to capitalize and, and be that team that, that won six or seven in a row by just being clinical uh, in, in one that I th- think should be more open than we've seen out of Buffalo uh, of late. And uh, okay. my bad, Lee Buff, I just want to add one more. Um, it's funny, too. It's It seems pretty, like, square, right? Oh, okay, why is Detroit a dog? They're still in it, this, this, and that. But, um, you know, it's a larger conversation, but I think in just all sports in general, maybe it's legalization, whatever it is, some of these like squarish spots, like, you know, we've tried to be sharp and go the other way. And like, I think more than ever, squarish spots like are cashing more. It seems to me more than they have like in in the olden days. I I could be wrong about that, but it certainly feels that way. You'll have to fire up a a bet lab system for that one. (laughs) You could title it that squarish spots since gambling got legalized widespread okay so it's the wings um for tim is his favorite underdog uh nick likes evgeny kuznetsov to register a point uh keep an eye on the prices for that one i like Sidney crosby as a hat trick candidate um in penguins for senators um tim you like the over in the Peng- penguins and senators nick uh we'll get your thoughts on this one then like i said it's basically a pick them uh total six and a half uh anything on what 
to me sticks out like a sore thumb on this this slate as like an absolute you know bananas game i don't think anybody's going to feel confident one way or another about how this game's going to go hence that's why i went with just i'm going to chase a price and hope it gets out of hand yeah i i think the over is a good bet here too the the penguins defensive play has just fallen off especially now that like the level of care is just clearly hit a bottom point and the the senators the same thing so i agree i don't really have much uh conviction to bet aside here but i think that the over is a pretty good bet and yeah, things are just falling apart for Pittsburgh. Like you can just feel that the room, and I mean the Senators, like what they've done recently is just absolutely shocking. And I don't even know what to say really with what what's gone on with them. You look at that, like the teams they've lost to over the seven game losing streak is like, I, what can you even say? It's it's a good thing for the fans because it looked like they were going to make that push towards getting like the eleventh overall pick, and now they're having, heading down towards the absolute basement. So. I didn't have much here. I like the over. I like punting on like some of your favorite prop pieces because it does feel like one where um, it's just going to be kind of lackadaisical out there. Yeah, that I think is a fair assumption. Um, what's that league in Minnesota called that all the, these players play in in in, in the summer? The Beauty League. The Beauty League. It's going to be at the Beauty League. Uh, so, yeah, someone should bring a, a sixer in there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <this one. laughs> Um, all right, let's talk about another barn burner, uh, Columbus and, and Montreal in Montreal. Um, jackets are a slight underdog plus one Oh five Habs minus minus one twenty five. This total also at six and a half. I'd rather play Columbus here as an underdog. I think, uh, both of these teams have shown some I don't know, spunk, I guess is the right word of late, um, with the way things have gone. I want to play it past this price though uh but i think that you just look at this as, as a coin flip and if you're getting plus 105 at on uh on the jackets uh you can take it and, and feel pretty good that they've got every chance of coming out on this uh out of this uh coin flip um uh, with a win i just it's it's also as nick likes to point out like you can't have you can't bet this if daniel tarasov's in goal for uh columbus so not something that i'm likely going to end up on but it would be columbus for me if anything nick yeah i'm right there with you i kind of think columbus are pass it's funny talking about this game after like the sens pens one yeah where like <laughs> both the blue jackets and canadians are like clearly playing more engaged hockey and like are kind of almost like invigorated with some of what's going on even though they're still losing two and still just completely out of the playoff mix but, but um they both kind of got some young guys trending upwards I think this this looks about fair. I'm close with you. I'd lean towards the Blue Jackets, but I feel like Montreal's kind of shown enough compete that I'm not overly interested in uh, trying to get involved with this one. Yeah, I was, I was just basically going to look um, if I had to bet it. I was going to bet whatever team uh, was a dog, and that dog had to be a plus money price because I just definitely think it's uh, to totally a coin flip type game. And so if you're getting plus money or better on Columbus. Don't hate it at all. It's just um, not a game I'm particularly interested in and in, in putting real money on. Also, too, you mentioned the Columbus goaltending situation. You certainly um, cannot bet it if it's if it's Tarasov. So that's that's how I feel. Okay, uh, I actually think this one, despite the wide odds, is quite interesting. Uh, Sharks are in Philadelphia to take on the Flyers. This is Philadelphia's last soft game before an absolutely – Brutal, brutal schedule coming up. So they play the Sharks, then they play Leafs, Bruins, Leafs, Canes, Bruins, Panthers, Rangers after that. So this is a um, a must-win game. Adding to the intrigue, of course, is John Tortorella won't be on the bench. It'll be former Islander interim head coach Brad Shaw. We miss you, Brad. Uh, he'll be manning the, the Flyers bench. They are minus 298, Sharks plus 240. Coming off of a, a thrilling 2-1 win over those Senators. Uh, the total here is six. This is, it doesn't look like a, a must win game, you know, by definition because of who they're playing, but it is a must win game for the Sharks. You have to, I mean, for the Flyers, you have to pick up these two points before that stretch. Um, That doesn't mean you should just, you know, blindly lay it with, with Philadelphia. That said, I think that you're going to see a, just a, a pack of wild animals against the Sharks team with their without their coach. I think what Tortorella did 
and getting fined and suspended actually is fine with him. I think he probably likes it that this should, you know, inspire his team and, and, and show that, you know, I'm still in the fight despite a couple of, you know, trades and the way they manage their assets at the trade deadline. Um, they're coming off of a, an embarrassing loss in Tampa. I think this has one way traffic written all over it, Nick. Yeah, I'm right with you. I think if I was to play this game, I actually think the price is there on the flyers. I don't hate just targeting them to win by like three or four and just kind of run the sharks out of the building. And I, I think the sharks have been competing respectably. You know, we, we gave out on, uh, Andy's show, the puck portfolio, the sharks on Friday, and they came through versus the Sens. But I think that for one, and it might just be a mental thing for me rather than like something I've dug into the numbers for, but it does feel like Philly's really consistently came through in these spots versus like, like a Chicago. Like I know they just completely blew the doors off Chicago two weeks ago and after big losses. And it feels like every time that they give up a little ground in this race, they've been pretty, pretty good at pushing back. And San Jose really has just been this bad. Like I don't really want to rate that win too much. Um, over like in what kind of just seemed like a good spot for versus a Sens team that's just fully over it. So I don't hate laying it with with Philly here. I, I think they're going to come out and just kind of blow the doors off them. Um, I'd be interested to see if, if it's Cooley. I don't know what the sh- what the sh- shot prop is too. It just or the other thing you can do, but they've started to get pretty low. But granted, the last time I did say this, Urson made like. 17 saves or something is keep an eye on betting his save prop to go under because it feels like one of these ones where philly should be able to hold the sharks to next to nothing and and just play their team game so yeah i like it i'm in on philly kind of however you want to target them in this game yeah i mean i don't know how much um you know stock you really put into the tortorella not being there and i think if anything leboff you nailed it and that it's kind of the um you know, the old like baseball mantra, like manager gets tossed to, to, sh- to show his team that, Hey, I still care. We all need to still care here. Like, so if anything, I actually think it probably helps them probably lights a fire under them a little bit. in in terms of, you know, all the things that, uh, that you said, despite the deadline, all this, like he, he's, he's still fighting. Um, the, both these teams are under teams, pretty big under teams this year. So, um, I could be a little bit interested in under six if you wanted to, but, um, you know, I don't, love the the idea that the sharks can certainly just get blown out uh you know six one or something like that um and just gathering what you said nick about um uh urson saves under they it could be a good little correlation if you go under saves under under saves and under for the game total like a reverse uh correlation there so that could could be a little something too if you're able to same game parlay that yeah, and I think we got to put a note out there about the trade deadline trade just because I feel like, you know, some people like to hear some in- input on like what we think of these things. I really don't see it for the Sharks. I know it kind of de- comes down to how you value Edstrom, but to retain that money for that long versus a division rival on like a legitimate game-changing player who actually just holds value on that contract already just seems a little nuts to me. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I hope our guy Javier is happy with the deal because it's a little scary in my opinion. I believe the Sharks have been a dog in every game this year. I, I believe. I have to double check, but that's what I think. And they've they've actually treated us quite well. Uh yeah, so I'm, I'm with you, Nick. I think a, an alternate spread here, or, you know, if you want to target Philly to shut out uh, San Jose, that is fine too. Um, okay, let's go to Arizona and Minnesota. Our beloved Coyotes are plus 160. The playoff push has stuttered, I would say. Um, Andre you think? Trigny, yeah, What makes you think that? Bit, just a little bit. Um, but hey, huge swing game here against the Wild. If we could just win this one and then the next 20 games, we might find our way back in. Um, Minnesota's minus 192 with this total six and a half. I got nothing uh, of interest in this one, Nick. Yeah, I have nothing of interest here either. Um, I think that it looks pretty appropriate to me. And uh, at this point, I'm just really hoping the fly- the Coyotes don't go under their 74.5 season betting total. It's the only points one I actually played. So watching that just completely blow up has been ridiculous. They're on pace for like 85 two months ago. And I think Minnesota's shown just enough kind of like these teams just played 
a somewhat competitive game. I still feel like what's left of Arizona should be able to bounce back somewhat. So that's kind of my case and why I think this game looks a little fair. Um, yeah, I didn't really have too much to add there. Yeah, and Nick, I deemed that ticket lost uh, a long time ago. Um, I believe my like cash out option is like seven dollars now. So you know, um, I think that's yeah. I don't know. I, I think you're off on that one to be honest. They were pacing way, way ahead of it until like a month ago. So you're being a little pessimistic. I, the, pessimistic. You're, yes, the pacing, but they um, that losing streak really, really hurt the math. Um, oh yeah, it's. I mean, they're still right math. there. Yeah, you're right. You know, okay. That's that's I appreciate your optimism here. Um, I do the thing where I deem it lost and hopefully it's a surprise in the last week of the season, um, if they jump over it. But um <clears throat> I would just say be careful here. And I know um it wasn't the reason I bet Detroit um the like must win type thing. I just thought it was the bottom for them. But this is be careful of this being like the Minnesota, oh, they have to win this um handicap, which you know, we know in the past, especially with the NFL, that's not really um, the best route to go. It tends to be overpriced a little bit. So I would just say be cautious of that if you're jumping all in on Minnesota here. Yeah, the one comment I'll throw out there too, because a uh, follower that I really like asked about the game theory of pulling the goalie. And I know that, so first off, if you want, you could research. They do it a lot in the KHL. I didn't dive into the actual numbers of it. And I, I know, Tim, I'd be here interested to hear what you say too. But... I didn't really get it because I like it would make sense to me basically if the Predators didn't get that point if you won in overtime. Do you know what I mean? Like they already were getting the loser point. For me, right. it doesn't make sense. And the problem is I know it's so easy to control the puck four on three once you have full possession, but there's so much randomness when you finally pull the trigger on a shot. Like it looked amazing because Boldy just sent it like perfect shot whatever but you know if he misses that there's a rim there's whatever there's a loose puck still i don't know if like you dominate loose pucks enough with four guys over three that like there isn't too much of a chance that it just goes the other way and the guy gets to shoot an empty net so i thought it was a bit of a bold decision i i i, I mean it was sweet as like a viewer of the game but i don't know if it means it's like should uh change things moving forward i think it only really makes sense if they really really valued like getting the overtime win I don't know, but I, definitely was interesting. Personally, I, I mean, I loved it. And then I get what you're saying about um, like they're now that now it's just like a one point swing, right? Because it's they each are going to get that loser point no matter what. So it make more sense for a two point swing, i.e. like a four point swing if they had done it yeah. for, to guarantee a regulation predators loss um, in doing so. But I, I just look at when they did pull them and like as they have full possession four on three. I actually tend to think it, it is easier to keep possession. Um, oh, it with, for sure is, but I just mean, eventually there's a shot, right. And then it's, yeah. loose. I don't know. No, no, you're, you're right. But I mean, I, I, I looked at it and I, I honestly thought to myself, why don't more teams do this? Cause I, I just think it's, these teams don't give up the puck and you can pretty much guarantee um, four on three. You can pretty much guarantee a clean shot. Like if you really want to. And, and, yeah, I and obviously a higher chance on a collection. I mean, I mean, what I said could just be completely wrong because they do this a lot in the KHL and there's a sample out there. So um, who knows? It's I, I want to do that. That, was, that. I think that was sick. I, I, maybe maybe Marblehead's doing that in the state championship next Sunday if we go to four on four overtime. I, I don't know. That was, <laughs> or three on three overtime. All right, go headers. Um, yeah, to, to bring back a, another reference to that 2007 Islanders run, uh, they needed the Maple Leafs to beat the Canadians in regulation to keep their season alive on Saturday night hockey night in Canada. So there was a, a scenario where um, the Leafs would have to pull their goalie in regulation to keep the, if Montreal got a point. They would get in. And um, luckily, we didn't get to that. But yeah, there was a scenario where it could have been possible where the Leafs would be tied in a in in a, in a game against the Canadians and in regulation pull their goalie. So that stuff's always fun. Um Okay, Florida and Dallas potential Stanley Cup preview here. The Cats and are minus one hundred five on the road. Stars minus one fifteen. Uh, total here six. It looks like Evan Rodriguez will play. Uh, Aaron Eckblad is out for a couple weeks for Florida, so just make sure you note that. Um, I th think all of us would would agree that Florida in a vacuum the better team. 
marginally maybe by da uh, against Dallas. Um, and I think that these odds reflect that. I, I think that this one looks right to me. I know you guys are on opposite sides. So Tim, you can go first. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Dallas here. The Ekblad thing. So I actually have them closer to even, honestly, Leboff. If anything, it's a, it's a smaller tick towards Florida, but I think, I think Dallas is quite honestly, the, the class of the West. I, I keep saying this, if they had made that, the TANF deal on Friday, people would have made a, a bigger deal out of it. It's kind of like a recency bias thing. And Nick has been on it since the jump about Stan Coven. Uh, um, I think this could be a Stanley Cup final preview. So Ekblad being out is a big deal for me. And then you just add in that, and this isn't like the greatest way to handicap, but Florida has a chance to cool off here a little bit. They have a tough week ahead of them at Dallas, at Carolina, and then Tampa Bay. So I, I don't know if they value the conference, um, uh, the conference wins more, but I just think that Dallas should be closer to when you factor in home ice, a, a little bit bigger favorite for me. So uh, I'm on Dallas here. Yeah, I was close. I didn't really have a firm opinion on side. Like I, the best Panthers number out there is plus 102, which I think is pretty reasonable, especially they have like no difference in splits in terms of, of home and road, which I'll always point out because it always seems to get, uh, in fact, they're actually slightly better on the road so far this year. And the Ekblad thing obviously matters, but they did thrive pretty pretty significantly without him this year. We've seen that they can handle it, so it hurts, but I think that's kind of the case against it. And the thing for me, Tim, is just that like, I see the case for Dallas being kind of worthy of being a home favorite here, but the reason that I just couldn't quite do it is that Edinger just can't find his game. And last week they were... And again, like I've been saying, I like the Stars to win the Cup, and it's part of the reason I still do, but it's getting more and more concerning that Edinger just cannot figure it out. He's really struggling. They're this good in spite of that. So that's kind of the main case for me there in a game where I don't have like a passionate take one way or another um, is just that he hasn't really shown very well, and they're kind of like trying to fight through it. But uh, um and I, I do think he'll probably still get the start. Wedgwood was good on Saturday, but who knows? It's it's uh yeah, that's kind of the one thing that I think works against them a little bit here. But yeah, no, you're. I think I'm. I have um definitely mentally like handicapped Dallas with a way that he's just going to figure it out, and that's just not. Oh no, I agree, and I think that's why they're such a good cup out rate because it's like you look at the concerns relative to like every other team and now their prices come down so much but that was kind of the reason why i thought it was such a good play is like they have no holes except for a goalie that everyone expects to eventually be really good uh find, needing to find his game so that's a lot less to poke at than some teams i'd say maybe bobrovsky can have a conversation with him tell him what it's like to turn it on for the playoffs <laughs> yeah i mean and then wedgewood's been a really good backup too like i just I know that's not like an overly exciting thing to lean on, but I still feel like he has more upside than he kind of showed when he was in that stretch of playing like every single night and that really tanked his season long numbers. So mm -hmm. there's definitely some avenues for them to figure it out. Okay. Uh, let's move on to our favorite bets for Tuesday's 10 game slate. We'll start with uh, Carolina and New York. The Rangers are visiting the Canes is a plus 130 underdog. Carolina minus 155 total here of six. Um, the Rangers on a back-to-back. -back. They play Monday against the Devils at Madison Square Garden. Uh, Tim, you, you can lead the conversation here because you've pegged one of these teams as your favorite bet. Yeah, I the best number I see here is minus 150 for the Carolina Hurricanes hosting the Rangers. Rangers is a tricky little back-to-back -back for them home and then down to Carolina. So, uh, I mean, I know they're going quick on Monday. Again, this is before that game. So we do know it's quick and um, which I guess changes the math a little bit, but I just think this Carolina team um, is definitely better than the Rangers. They're, they're getting ready to go on a, a big run, I think, and just continue it. I've, I've fully believed what Nick has told me about, uh, about Carolina and they, uh, this Rangers team, I'm just, I think, Leboff, you made such a good point about the swing between them, about between the rain, uh, the Carolina Hurricanes getting Gensel and the Rangers essentially losing out on Gensel. It basically is like you know, and a, a pick six in football. It's a it's a fourteen point swing. So uh, I know it's it doesn't necessarily matter right now, but 
I think this Rangers team is still full of flaws in terms of the five on five stuff. I mean, we've been sending stuff in our group chat that talks about them being towards the bottom of the league and a lot of advanced metrics that don't have anything to do with goalie and power play. So uh, I just think the gap should be a little longer with this, with this back to back and how good Carolina is. Yeah. It's uh there's there's been points and stretches over the past couple seasons where you're like how how are the Rangers getting away with it and this is one of them um where the numbers truly get drastic uh that a lot of times then they start to round back towards you know league average and and 5 on 5 at some point but right now since the all-star break like it's them and the sharks at the bottom uh in terms of preventing scoring chances of quality at 5 on 5 they also don't generate a ton um uh, at 5 on 5 either they they're playing like this high event style uh at when, when it's even strength they're just banking on Igor who's just been lights out um for a while he will be in goal here so who knows but yeah, I'm with you I actually I think that uh minus 155 or better on on Carolina's fine um in a game that they should dominate at um even strength Jacob Truba's out Adam Fox is questionable for Monday night with illness so who knows what they do uh, there, um, this this looks like a, a play on the chalk, Nick. Yeah, I fully agree. You guys know I'm always always going to like Carolina here. I just feel like traveling back to back, questionable demon on the back end for a team that's already given up 3.2 unexpected goals against per sixty at five on five over the last ten. Like Mike said, that's better than only the Sharks. And I know people will always point out like the the Rangers. First off, the you always hear people just want to say that the numbers don't matter. But I do think there's been a lot of good cases recently that they do. You look at Detroit and this all these things were working against them. And then the bottom just falls out the second that they get in some some tougher games and that their luck turns a little bit. So I don't think the Rangers are like a Detroit, especially because we've seen that this core can win with like such a lowly uh, share of play at five on five over several seasons with their ability to just kind of score against the run of play and Shisterkin's ability to steal games. But this recent stretch is really taking it far and this is a really tough back to backs. So I think Carolina will definitely play to their number. It's a little scary when we're talking about Shisterkin versus probably Anderson, I think we'll get another chance. He hasn't really played his way off of it. And I imagine he's kind of the one that they're envisioning being the main guy come playoff time. Um he had a bit of a weird outing Sunday versus Calgary giving up two, but also just he was just standing there for like 15 minutes at a time. So a little odd. But I think that the Canes deserve to be a bigger favorite here, even if it seems a little crazy when you're talking about them taking on like the division leading Rangers. And they're also out there at the time of recording and and the, the way the game goes tonight is going to play a huge role in this. But they're at plus 145 to win the division. I still think that's playable. I think this is closer to a camp coin flip with the the runway that the Canes have left and the fact that really it's just those two teams at this point. So it just basically comes down to handy, how you handicap like Carolina being able to close basically three points in the standings, four depending on how tonight's going goes, I guess. But I, I would play this. And then I, I should note since obviously there's the game tonight, that if the Rangers win tonight, I would just should probably move to like plus one. Carolina will probably move to plus one fifty five or plus one fifty, and then I would just still play that. Okay, uh, so Tim's on the Canes. I'll go next. Um, I'm going back to Colorado Avalanche uh, to continue the chalk theme here and the best bets. Uh, they are minus one fifty five right now. Uh, they'll be traveling to Calgary take on the Flames, who are coming back at plus. 130 at the time of recording. Uh, this number is going to move. I actually like uh, Colorado on the puck line here. Um, Calgary has, you know, the adm- admirable effort to kind of like punch up and keep themselves in this scrap for a, a playoff spot out West. But um, I think these two teams are about to start trending in opposite directions and in a pretty big way. I think the gap is is wide. The odds reflect that with, with Colorado being a pretty significant road favorite. Um, Colorado solved its issues. We talked about this uh, quite a bit um, leading into the trade deadline that Colorado was the team that we thought had a, a fixable flaw that they could go and shop for at the trade deadline. And they did exactly that by getting Casey Middlestat. And they also uh, take some of the bite out of the loss of losing a player like Bowen Byram by uh, getting Sean Walker just to uh, plug him in into that hole. 
I think this Avalanche team is exponentially better than it was before the trade deadline and before those moves. The ceiling is a lot higher. I think the Flames are the exact opposite, and they're still getting maybe a little bit too much credit for the bounce back that they had. I know th- the wheels kind of came off over the weekend. Um, so I think that this is one-way traffic for Colorado. So at plus 130 or better, I like um, the the puck line. Nick, anything here? Yeah, I'm right with you. The Avs made such good moves, and they're going to turn it around. And you talk about losing a player like Bo and Byram, which at his peak when they won the Cup, he was obviously insane, but that was a lot of injuries ago, and he's been horrific this year. So the replacement value of Walker, if he plays the way he did play in Philadelphia, is going to be significant on that front as well. So I actually think they got a lot better, and I really like the way that they flipped around all the pieces there. And then I also think that Yakov Trenin is a really good player, and that that was a really smart addition to round out the bottom six. So I love everything they did, and their cut prices have tanked accordingly. But yeah, I agree. I think this looks a little short, considering the way the bottom's kind of coming out for Calgary. It feels, feels like they had their pushback. And now you look at it, the defense close decimated, the pieces. And, you know, this is a little different than just like the Lindholm loss too, which like we were kind of did a good job of buying on them right around that. But now you're talking about there's no suit, like there's no Kuzmen, Kuzmenko coming back into those Hannafin and Tanev roles. There's just D-men that have been claimed off waivers and are playing, were playing in the HL. So the defense core is not what it was. And it has shown recently, like dating back to that cracking game, They've given up quite a bit. So, yeah, I agree. I think that the Avs should be a bigger favorite here, and I, I like the spot. Colorado, all the reasons you guys said, and I like it even more so. First half of a back-to-back for Colorado. They'll play uh, at Vancouver on Wednesday night. So, got to grab this one against the Flames because nothing's guaranteed against Vancouver. And on top of that, Calgary, first game back from a southeastern swing. Love it for uh, Colorado here. Yeah. Uh, one-way traffic for the Avs, perhaps one-way traffic for the Canes, and maybe one-way traffic for the Knights. Uh, Nick, that's where you're going with your favorite bet. Uh, they're minus 130, taking on the Kraken, plus 110, total of six. Yeah, so I, I'm going to give out the Knights money line, and I'll say if uh, Vince Dunn plays, go to minus 140, and then I'd say go to minus 145 if Dunn is not going to play. And for me, this just feels like the time to buy on the Knights. Um, like as, as a fan of the game, I'm trying, like I, I feel like I want the Kraken to win this, but I look at it as a better and I'm like, I just think if this Knights current group had played together a little longer, this probably isn't the number. We saw them have a really horrible stretch last season and start to trend up uh, heading towards the playoffs and obviously in the playoffs. And I think that this is kind of the time for that now. And you look at like how many guys are now playing in the roster or like on the team that weren't playing throughout this horrible stretch. It's a lot. They haven't had Petrangelo even for much of it. Haven't had Shea Theodore. I know he's been back for a bit while they've still been struggling, but that's two big names that are going to make a difference. Obviously, Hannafin is going to be pretty critical. And then I think Mantha, given the way that the wings are actually pretty short, is pretty important. And then obviously you get a larger sample of Jack Eichel. So I'm kind of throwing like, their recent play out the window a lot here because if you're actually just going to consider like the process of the recent play and the results, it seems kind of insane to bet them at like minus 135 here, but it's basically a whole new roster than it was. So I feel like it's the right time to buy on the Knights getting a really important win here over the Kraken. And then obviously from the Kraken side of things, I think Dunn is a really, really relevant piece. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, keep an eye out on his news tomorrow ahead of uh, the morning skate. Yeah, I'm on I'm on Vegas as well here. Um, I would say team team number two uh, to Colorado in terms of fixable problems, which their problems were. Can we just get some NHL bodies uh, in here to fill out this roster? And by means of health and by trade, they have definitely done that. So this is um, this is a, a different Vegas team, and I expect them to. Get on a bit of a run here. I think it's. Uh, I was kind of shocked to see the the number open this low, Nick. I know you said that the, their run of play doesn't ref, reflect reflect that, but I think they're about to start to get going here. And from a gambling standpoint, I think you want to grab it before you know it starts to to go in that direction. Grab some Vancouver love here by um, picking them to beat the Seattle Kraken on uh, on Tuesday night and, and get it going here. But Leboff, yeah, I don't know if you did. On, I don't know if you did on purpose, but we skipped. The Anaheim Ducks and the <sighs> Chicago Blackhawks. 
I didn't do it on purpose, actually. I just forgot to jot it down on my, my trusty legal pad. Uh, we, How could you, you know forget what? that one? You know what? I'll say, let's put it this way. We, we, we gave it our best bets. I, I, I like Vegas, too, by the way. Um, we gave it our best bets, but the real showstopper here is uh, <laughs> is Anaheim and Chicago. Um, it feels like this this slate is is littered with, with these kind of games, like Penn Sands, Jackets, Habs. Now we got Ducks and Blackhawks. It's a pick 'em. It's it's an, it's I. Uh, if you guys have any thoughts here, uh, what do you want to do? Bet Bedard to score a couple goals again, or I I I couldn't find you an angle here if I if I tried. Um, Nick, what about you? Uh, the opening right now, and I actually kind of had brushed by this too, but right now, Fanduel's number for over five and a half is minus one thirty. I actually think that's pretty playable here, and. Like, I don't think it's a very hard case to make. We've seen, like, a lot of these kind of lottery bowls just seem like they always break open. Like, it feels like a lot more of them than not. I did lose on the over last week, Ducks versus Sens, but I still think that number is just way too low. Um, Chicago, Chicago's kind of starting to open it up, get a little more loosey goosey. And I, I also would agree, I don't, I wouldn't hate to follow up Bedard's big game the other night here. And then I guess the other factor in that too, though, I would watch like what the Ducks word is on on having like all their offensive guys back because I do think that was kind of what killed some of the games last week. You get AHL guys up there that are very motivated but don't have the offensive talent to, uh, you know, pay off chances or anything like that. But I, I think over five and a half is actually a pretty decent look. And I think it'll be a popular play to, to uh, kind of target some of the superstars on both teams, but I definitely wouldn't disagree with that at all either. Over five and a half, Nick. Great, great look on that. We found something for this game. Refter saving the best for last. Yeah, that's a, that's a good look there. I, I need to have something on this game. Come on, this is this is the game of the night. What do we? What do we? A lot of these here? games are underrated. I think maybe that's just being like a. I I know a I degenerate, I, but I, I do that, think that well, like, always better. It's than funny, right? Think. You got Panthers, Stars. That's a headliner. Like Rangers, Hurricanes is huge. Um, Knights, Kraken is big for both, uh, obviously. And then you have the the other three, right? Like Habs, Jackets, Penn Sands, and Ducks. Carlson uh, versus Bedard. Cox. Car- yeah, Carlson versus Bedard. I do think, to me, the most compelling game of the night, um, and maybe I'm biased because it, it has a lot to do with the Islanders' playoff pushes, Sharks and Flyers. I think that one is, is going to be a box office to watch. So, and I mean that honestly. I do, I too. I saw you laughing, Nick. I, I'm in. The Sharks yeah. are a team. What are we talking about? No, they are a team, and I, I just think it's going to be fun to watch with, you know, the, the how the Flyers respond without uh, Tortorella. Is he going to be, uh, like, outside? Like, where where is he going to be? Is he going to be, like, a, you know, is he going to be, like, banging on the on the door to get in? Like He'll be in section, like, what, 311 in the gods <laughs> rooting on. Um, But you remember last year, I think it was Jeff Marrick who brought this up, last year that the sh- Remember he just like left for a couple of games. He was like, "I'm gonna go watch from up upstairs." And oh while yeah, the Flyers played out like right. for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that's true. You went up, you went up top. You're right. Yeah, that's, they're a funky bunch. Funny. Those Flyers, funky, funky bunch. Um, okay. So off the top, our our reimagined underdog segment for this uh, episode. Nick liked uh, Kuznetsov uh, over half a point. I like Sidney Crosby to score a hat trick against the Ottawa Senators at a big number. Uh, and Tim liked the Detroit Red Wings against the Buffalo Sabres. Best bets came in on the Carolina Hurricanes, the Golden Knights against the Kraken, and the puck line for the Avs against the Calgary Flames, the tailspin in Calgary Flames. That does it for today. Uh, we'll be back for Wednesday. Take a, maybe a, a little bit of a wider lens view of the leagues of some future markets as we head into the thick of the stretch run. Uh, and then once again, Thursday for a 12-game slate on Thursday night um and we'll we'll start to talk about our 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 cadence and our schedule for um when the playoffs come around or um you know if the, if, if the if we're supposed to be off like a Friday or Monday and there's some big games for the playoff push we'll get to all that um with our podcast producers soon so so keep an eye out for that uh, otherwise best of luck with all your bets on Tuesday night thank you for listening um and thank you to our producer Noah